joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, in the context of, you know, it's full day one at the Web Summit. Last night, Stephen Hawking uh, was talking about AI. Um, then we also heard from politicians who were both eloquent and um, incredibly relevant, Carlos Guterres and Margaret Vestager, who talked about different things. They didn't talk about AI. Stephen Hawking did. And I'm curious from your perspective, is it time that politics had an opinion on AI? Yeah, I think politicians are still largely asleep at the wheel ah. when it comes to the, the big issues that AI poses for us. I think there's a big disconnect between what I see at the research conferences in AI and what politicians are talking about. It was mind-blowing, for example, that when uh, we had Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump debate jobs, none of them even mentioned AI. Like, mm -hmm. hello, here is the elephant in the room right there. It's not on the radar screen. And, and how do you think it should be on the radar screen? What form does that take? Is it legislation? Is it awareness? Or is it even opinion? Well, step one is clearly not, it's clearly just insight. Yeah. And getting people, politicians to educate themselves about what's actually happening in the field. Not both for near term things and long term things. In the near term, there's obviously all the issues about how we can make sure that all the prosperity being generated by automation actually ends up benefiting everybody mm. and not just increasing inequality. You know, a lot of uh, top economists think that the reason that income inequality has grown so much in the US and in, in Europe that it's given us Donald Trump and Brexit and a lot of angry people is in large part because of automation. Obviously, it doesn't have to be this way. If, if we can all have a lifelong vacation and have all the goods and services produced for us, it could also be great. That's one issue. Another very near-term one I think politicians are largely just sleepwalking into is lethal autonomous weapons. Mm. So we heard a wonderful discussion just now about all the fun, fantastic things AI can do for us around the house. Mm. But we're also on the cusp of starting an arms race and just figuring out how to make uh, little devices that can murder anonymously very little money and and uh, this is something uh, politicians are actually getting together finally in Geneva next month to discuss whether it should be banned and the AI community really wants this to have to get banned just like the biologist pushed hard for a ban on bioweapons and the chemist put for pushed for a ban on, on uh, chemical weapons and you know all science and technology can be used to help people or to harm people and I think if politicians wake up more to this, we can steer this in a great direction so this can be, so AI can be the best thing ever, not the worst thing not ever. Not the worst. Uh, and but do it as a global community, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't make sense for one country to stop bioweapons if all the others kept sure. building them. That's why we got together and yeah. got an international agreement. And that's what the community really wants to see happen with AI too, so we can get all these benefits from it. Your new book is not, uh, it's not a happy read, Max. Uh, it, and I mean that in the... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I tried to write a hopeful uh, book. Uh, I think in the sense that, as insightful as it is, it paints what could be a disturbing picture of the future. And so you must have, apart from research, you must have personally contemplated this, that as we reach further, we come from the short, medium term. When we go that far into the future, what do you think will become of mankind? Life 3.0. Yeah. What, is it, what does it look like? Well, first of all, I, I don't really like uh, phrasing the question as, you know, what will happen to us in the future, as if we were just some kind of pathetic passive bystanders mm. here at, at the Web Summit, wondering passively what would happen to us. This is our future, right? Mm. We get to decide what we're building. And I think the most interesting question is, what can we do now to mm. get a good thing going? Second, I think many people are under the misconception that this is all science fiction, the idea that AI is actually going to succeed in doing everything humans do. But that's not what many of the world's leading researchers actually think who are trying to build general artificial intelligence. There have been a number of polls suggesting that, they, that the median guess is we're going to succeed in maybe f a few decades. Mm. And if that happens, of course, we have to ask ourselves if we're no longer the smartest entities yeah. on the planet, you know, then what? You know, the reason we have more power here than tigers isn't because we're stronger or have sharper teeth. It's because we're smarter. So might we lose control or whatever? 
I th I'm more optimistic, though, and I hope at least some of my optimism came through in the book, because I, I feel that uh, Hollywood specializes in just giving us, getting us worried about the wrong things by presenting silly dystopias. That, um, if, we, if we can actually think hard about what sort of society we would like to create, mm. we see that there are incredible upsides. You know, uh, like a, a good friend of mine was just told that, that she had a, an incurable cancer. Incurable? Of course not. You know, that incurable there, there from the doctor's mouth just meant that we humans weren't yeah. smart enough to figure out how to cure it. If we can use artificial intelligence to amplify our intelligence, we can greatly accelerate all the progress in science and technology to create the help, help life flourish like never before. And uh, I think the sooner we start to really think about these huge possibilities for good and for bad, we can steer the development in a good direction. And the potential, though, for coming away from that path. And by that, I mean, you know, we end up, you know, we have, say, things like the obesity crisis in Europe that we see. Yeah. Um, you know, we cannot disassociate the role of the technology business in that. We cannot give people um, the path to a more sedentary lifestyle and not expect there to be human consequences. In exactly the same way when you talk about artificial intelligence, what happens to art, culture, and revolution in a world dominated, or at least perhaps run, or influenced by artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's a really good question. And as you saw, I didn't write my book to s tell people what to want, but rather to encourage people to think about what we really want. You know, the, I, and fundamentally, I think the question is, do we want to own our technology, or do we want our technology to own us? I you know, strongly <laughs> prefer the former. And you know, I, I'm really optimistic that we can create a great future with technology and even with, with superhuman AI, as long as you win the race between the growing wis power of the tech and the growing wisdom with which you manage it. But I think we're going to have to change strategies here, you know, because in the past, the strategy was always to just learn from mistakes. And then fire, screw up, get the fire extinguisher. And, and I think the most spectacular failure we're seeing right now is with nuclear weapons, where we're still stuck in that mentality. But we don't want to have an accidental nuclear war and then say, oops, let's learn from that mistake. You would never walk into a kindergarten here in Lisbon and say, hey, here, take this box of hand grenades and play with it, right? But I feel, as a physicist, that when we physicists gave hydrogen bombs to Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump and, and Putin, it was very much like giving a box of hand grenades to them. I don't feel convinced that these people have the wisdom mm. to really manage the, this powerful technology wisely enough. And I would like us to learn from this with AI and get it right this time and develop the wisdom first. We I, but that's a challenge, though. So who, you know, who, who does that then? Well, all of us. But I mean, the good news is we still have some time, right? If, yeah. if you figure it's, we have 30 years, say, until super intelligence, then If we start now, there's, yeah. there's really a good chance that we'll have the answers by the time we need them. But I, I think we shouldn't uh, let that lull us into a false sense of security, right? That's why I've been working with Stephen Hawking and others to try to accelerate AI safety research. You know, some of the questions we have to answer are so difficult yeah. that they might take a few decades mm. to, to get to answer. And that means we should start researching them now, not the night before someone switches on a super intelligence. And when you talk about, when you mention, um, uh, intelligence, fake news, for instance, uh, yeah. something that you know we hear Facebook saying, yes, we're going to do, we're going to a put lots of people and algorithms and artificial intelligence um, to sieve out the fake news. But let's say 25 years in the future, um, what happens to political opinion and political debate? Is with given the progression, is it possible that we sanitize? opinion and debate, given that we have access to answers so easily? It's a really excellent question. So for, first of all, of course, the issue with fake news is about to get much worse when we start getting fake video, because we're already on the cusp right now in 2017 of, of having computer-generated videos yeah. of you saying that, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> th imagine the worst thing you could possibly say. And it looks exactly like you. Yeah. And uh, when we, we've seen before how damaging videos can be of politicians and so on. Mm. 
and uh, when you can no longer tell what's fake or not, it's, it's difficult. At the same time, I think your question illustrates a very important point that the answers we need, we can't just turn to like tech nerds like myself mm. for them because these are questions that go far beyond technology where we have to involve everybody. Mm. We wanted to think about what sort of society do we want to create that manages these things wisely. Uh, and so when, when we go on though, you know, so that's, that's politics and the potential of AI within politics. Um, you know, AI seems like it's very adapt or adept at, you know, um, polls, at predicting outcomes. My fear would be that, you know, we get to the point where, well, we know all the answers. Is there any point in doing so many things, you know? And that's the danger, I think. But also from a commercial perspective, from insurance companies, sieving my data and everybody else here. Um, you know, I don't get life insurance, you do because of your clean living lifestyle. You know, things like that. Do you think, how do we legislate, prevent, or allow that to exist as a parallel? Yeah, it really depends on, on what sort of society we want to create. Mm. I, I think, um, you know, I often get students walking into my office at MIT for career advice, and I always ask them the same question, where do you want to be in the future? Yeah. And if all they can tell me is that maybe they'll have cancer, maybe they'll be murdered, maybe they'll be run over by a bus, you know, that's a terrible strategy for career planning, right? And yet I think that is exactly what we as a species are doing. I mentioned earlier here that in Hollywood films, you almost only get to see dystopia visions, yes. right? And, uh, so to try to change that, the whole fifth chapter in my book, as you saw, was a series of thought experiments of 12 very different kinds of societies. Because I want to get people thinking, do we want this kind of society, that kind of society? And if we can start really building a shared positive vision mm. that we have very broad excitement around, then we can start to answer your kind of questions. Mm. If, you know, if this is what we want, then this is how we need to steer, this is how we need to how the legal system has to work, the media, everything, in order to, mm. to, to function that way. But if we have no clue what, where we're even trying to get, I think, then step one is really developing positive visions. Humanity is, uh, evolution's brought us to where we are. We're resilient, we're uh, smart, we do, we do some silly things. Yeah. But, you know, um, though, say global warming, uh, our environment, we've got to a point where things are changing. Yeah. And our ability to use technology to change, corrupt, pervert, or help. That's right. Is, is now here. How do you think, is this human evolution? Is AI human evolution? Yeah, there, there, so there are some people who say to me, Max, you know, um, don't worry about the uh, risks of AI and trying to steer yeah. things in the right direction because it's just the natural next yeah. step in the history of life. And if, you, if Homo sapiens goes extinct, well, that's for the better. But that, there's a fallacy in there because it, it neglects the fact that technology itself is morally neutral, mm -hmm. right? Is fire good or is it bad? Well, it's good for keeping our, our homes warm in the winter. It's bad for arson. You can program a machine to have any goals whatsoever, right? Intelligence itself doesn't make you good. If Hitler had become more intelligent, I think we would have been worse off, not better off, right? So just saying we're gonna defer to some machines because they're smarter, makes no sense. In fact, instead we should ask what goals do we want future life to have and make sure that machines adopt those goals. I think um, many people freak out at the very notion of having, of having entities around us that are smarter than us. But uh, actually, that's an overreaction because you and I and all of us have all been in the, in the presence of more intelligent entities already. Our mother and our father when we we're tiny, right? Why did that work out well? Well, because their goals were aligned with our goals. Mm. And uh, if we create more intelligent entities that we build ourselves, we should be good parents too, mm. to make sure yeah. that they adopt the goals that we think are good. And, 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 and I think I just want to emphasize why that is actually not so trivial as it might think. Uh, first of all, every parent knows it's not so easy <laughs> to make our kids adopt our goals, but uh, it's even harder with machines. Like if you tell your future self-driving car to get to the airport right, as fast as possible, and it gets you there covered in vomit and chased by helicopters, and you say, no, 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 that's not what I asked for. 
and it replies, that's exactly what you asked for. <laughs> You've appreciated how difficult it is for, to make machine really understand our goals. And that's the kind of questions I think we should really research now mm. so that when the time comes, we have the answers. Uh, the time frame, and I know that's one that you don't, you know, people probably ask you all the time, but as we look, as biotech improves, as you know, genetic, uh, the g human genome reveals more secrets, um, and then AI sort of sitting as a foundation for this, what, where, where do we see the intersection of all those technologies to get us to an AI-inspired yeah. future? So I think what we've seen now in the last few years is for the first time AI is succeeding to the point that uh, it's really making big money. Mm. That's what's different about this AI hype wave compared to the others and making it sustainable. In the near future, obviously, we're going to see a lot of job automation. We're going to see self-driving cars. Hopefully, we're not going to see an arms race b because there's going to be an international agreement on that. Uh, in terms of when we're, it's going to succeed to the, get to human level, it's some world leading experts say never. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're in the minority now. Most polls show AI researchers are guessing maybe a median decades, decades from now. And, uh, but there's a, there's a very wide range of, of guesses. So to me, the most interesting question isn't to try to speculate more in detail about what's going to happen, but rather to ask, you know, what can we do now yeah. to maximize the chances that things go well? If you, if you look at other less powerful tech you know, that gave us climate change, for instance, wouldn't it have been nice if we had paid a bit more attention to that 30 years ago? So what are you doing in the next, say, five, 10 years? Are so what I'm doing with my nerdy research at MIT and AI is uh, focusing on what I call intelligible intelligence. We're trying to figure out how we can take obtuse black box neural network based AI systems and transform them into equally capable things where we can actually understand how they work so we can trust them. We, and and my, uh, that's my day job. And then for, my volunteer, for the Future of Life Institute nonprofit, we're trying to encourage the kind of research we mentioned in AI safety, um, having machines understand and learn goals, figure out how to transform today's buggy, hackable computers into robust AI systems we can trust. Taking these sort of baby steps in the right direction so we can actually realize this wonderful potential that AI has for the future. And you remain an optimist. I'm an optimist, yeah. It's, uh, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not opti a naive optimist in the sense that I'm optimistic that the sun is going to rise over Lisbon tomorrow, regardless of what we do. I'm optimistic that if we actually take seriously that, hey, you know, this is science, yeah. not science fiction. It's probably going to happen. And then we really work together to develop, the, make sure the wisdom with which we manage this keeps pace with the power of the tech. Then I'm optimistic that we can really help life flourish like never before. And not just in the next election cycle, not just here on Earth, but even throughout our cosmos for billions of years. Max's, Max's book, Life 3.0, uh, recommend, as recommended by Elon Musk, <laughs> uh, is a remarkable read. Max, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you.